So guys, we just watched a huge reveal yesterday for the final shape. Now, there's a lot of things they touched on, including us going inside of the Traveler. I look at what's to come in the last seasons, the final shape itself, and then the years beyond that. Today, guys, we're going to be breaking down that 45-minute showcase and essentially giving you the TLDR version for everything, including the Hour Plus Post Show with Joe, Cosmo, as well as Dan. Now, first, let's talk about the stakes. Game director Joe Blackburn opens the reveal by setting clear stakes and expectations for the final shape. And I really like that things opened and ended with Joe here. But essentially, yes, we're going inside of the Traveler. The Witness is the deadliest entity we have ever faced. And prior to the launch of the final shape, there will be no betas or early access or guides. Now, the goal for this is that every player will be greeted with the same uncharted, vacuum-sealed world to have a truly fresh and surprising experience. This is an exciting promise as a player. But it's also important context for understanding the rest of the showcase. Bungie shows off lots of details, but it's a notably thinner showcase than what we've received for either The Witch Queen, which was a masterpiece by the way, or Lightfall, which didn't quite hit the mark. Now this seems very intentional, as Bundy's language over these two hours showing a spotlight on that day one experience. Next we need to talk about the story. Season The Witch is what's going to be seemingly setting the stage for entering The Traveler. And no lie already guys, the lore of this season is amazing. Not going to spoil anything, but it's been good so far. Now in the time since Lightfall, The Witness has constructed a monolith within the Traveler in an attempt to access its pale heart, which it will use to harness the power of the light. Now, once the Witness controls both light and dark paracausal powers, it believes it will be able to impose its vision of a perfect universe upon reality, that being the final shape. And you really got to see how the Witnesses views the universe. It wants to freeze it in perfection. Now, players will enter the portal and then traverse the pale heart destination, progressing from the portal to the monolith that the witness has constructed. Now in the post show, the devs actually shared that this journey must convey a sense of progress and that the journey begins in a comfortable place, but becomes more foreboding, surreal, and dangerous. Literally the words they use is like, it opens up in heaven and then suddenly you find yourself in hell. Now, if you play games like Half-Life 2 and its expansions, these are great examples of how a clear linear journey with a towering objective can create a strong sense of progression, no matter how weird things become. Now, environments within the Traveler reflect the past decade of a player's experience, including an overgrown version of the Destiny 1 Tower. I know, we're getting the D1 Tower back, as well as statues of characters and ghosts throughout. Now, the Witness and its monolith have been transforming and corrupting the Pale Heart. To what end? That's for us to find out. Now, to guide us through it all will be Kate 6, who Bundy calls our Virgil through the campaign. And on Kate's return, Joe emphasizes that his expansion is meant to feel like a distilled version of Destiny. All the stuff we know and love, and that the team couldn't imagine a finale without him. Now, another goal of the campaign will be to deepen our core characters, like Korra, and Zavala, and Kay. Now, within all these details, Bunny hopes to tell a story that will answer questions at the grandest scale, while remaining a legendary tale, quote, told around campfires by a bunch of companions. Now, the raid will feature the witness as its final boss. Joe describes the campaign of the final shape as being the penultimate episode of a TV series, while the raid will be the series finale. Now, Dan Makalev actually went on to say that they built bigger writer rooms and pulled personnel from across the studio to answer big questions and land a satisfying conclusion that sets up more stories. Now, Joe describes his structure as a reverse Taken King. Rather than giving a conclusive campaign with an add-on raid, that being King's Fall, the final shape will be the setup leading into the punchline in the raid. Now, players that do not play the raid on launch will still be treated to an appropriate finale in-game, though they do not describe how this will be delivered. And it actually makes me wonder if we're going to be in a scenario where that finale is not actually unlocked until the raid is actually beaten. Hopefully, it's going to be more engaging than the ink block cutscene summaries that we got after the last few. This needs to be epic. And honestly, I'm actually concerned that the raid may be too easy because Bungie wants everyone to experience that narrative finale. Hopefully, that's not the case though. Now, gameplay. The new destination and final shape will be the Pale Heart within the Traveler. Bungie describes this as the first linear destination in Destiny. Instead of the typical loop design with main areas and several offshoots, the Pale Heart will be a focused straight shot from the portal to the monolith. Not only will this provide a strong sense of progress, but it will ensure that day one players are focused on the campaign and only the campaign with no distractions. Now, after completing the campaign, the destination will fully unlock, allowing players to explore the inside of the Traveler more freely, though the devs didn't elaborate on what specifically that meant. Now, when discussing raid difficulty, Joe says that it would be a bummer. The 
Madness was less difficult than Val from Spire of the Stars. So, again, I had some concern with the difficulty of this raid. But considering he mentioned Spire of the Stars, that's the benchmark. And Spire messed up a lot of people day one. And actually, that raid has one of the lowest completion rates, I want to say, amongst all the raids. Now, he says that next week's reprise raid, Crota's in, will be brutal. Saying that they're cranking the knobs of difficulty on contest mode as a way of experimenting with the day one raid difficulty to find something appropriately challenging. Lightly in response to Root of Nightmares easy debut. So there you go, guys. I fully expected this considering that Crota's in was kind of memed on. A lot of people just called it a dungeon. So I'm curious to know how Bungie's going to amp things up. And considering the arsenal of weaponry and subclasses and everything that we have now, it has to be harder, guys. Or we're literally going to just walk straight through Crota's in. Now, subjugators. Guys, we have a new elite enemy type coming into the game in the final shape called subjugators. And yes, they look like many rogues from the Vow the Disciple raid. Now, they come in two variants. Now, the question that we have, are they Lubrians like Rook? Lore-wise, there's not supposed to be any left, but it could be another scenario like Tormentors and Nazarak and the clones and whatnot. And the devs just say that these are another in a line of captainy enemy design following the Lucent Hive and Tormentors. And the example they gave is like Tormentors bust in like the Kool-Aid guy and start smashing stuff similar to that of like Nazarak. Subjugators are more restrained, more tactical in how they approach the battlefield. Now, they actually beam in with a sound cue, so you'll know when they're coming. And they're going to essentially act as a battlefield commander, supporting groups of ads. And subjugators can grant what Joe calls pyramid buddies to ads, which he likens to Ark Souls, saying he's faced up the 10 scions with these little pyramid buddies at once. Now, what about abilities? Are we getting a new subclass? No, we're not, guys. And I know I said a while back that we were going to be getting a new subclass based on that leak. That is not the case. Now, I do not know if we're going to get that red subclass at some point in the future. That leak still looks super legit. It does not look like something that someone photoshopped. But Bungie has never given us back-to-back -back brand new subclasses. We've always had a year in between. Now, Guardians are going to be getting new light subclass supers and aspects. For Solar Warlocks, you're going to be receiving an unnamed ability spam super, which Bungie states is reminiscent of the Sunsinger in Destiny 1. Now, before you ask, no, we're not getting self-res back. However, Joe details that it's a low-key DPS powerhouse with constant grenades and melees while granting your whole fire team scorch on their weapons. Which, yes, does sound very similar to, like, Radiance back in Destiny 1. Now, which weapons receive the scorch is still being dialed in. But Joe claims that this is the sneaky way that this super actually puts out huge damage. Now, Warlocks, you're also going to be getting a Solar Soul. So, essentially, guys, a Solar Buddy granted to us through a new aspect. Now, Joe says that the over-reliance on Well of Radiance is a problem. The team is actually going to be tackling from many angles, including new weapon types. More on that in just a moment. As well as new support abilities like this one. Next, we have Void Titans, who will receive the Twilight Arsenal. No, it is not a roaming melee super. Essentially, guys, we're going to be throwing axes, three of them to be exact, and we're supposed to be able to pump out some huge damage, but at long range. And then, you and your teammates can pick them up as relic melee weapons, right? Now, this super was designed to break the meme of melee super titans, but after after throwing the axes, the devs realized they could have their void cake and eat it too. And we also have a new aspect which allows Titans to consume the grenade, Warlock style, to create a mini rally shield, which essentially acts like a moving barricade and emits a deadly blast of void energy when released. Now to our Arc Hunters. Fellas, Blade Dancer is back on the table, but with a twist. You are receiving a new super that grants you three knife charges. You will throw a knife across the map, and then you'll be able to teleport to it instantly, and then unleash this massive swirling attack. And if you remember a blade dancer back in the day, there was literally a mechanic for your super. The problem was you had to actually close the gap, and the AoE attack really wasn't that big. Now, the devs believe this is to be useful in some limited PvE instances, such as melee bosses, but that it will devastate the Crucible. All right. Now, Joe remarked that they are working hard to ensure that this is not the most oppressive ability they've ever shipped, but that it is very spicy. Now, a new aspect for hunters will allow them to leap into the air and then amplify themselves and their fire team. Now, while the showcase suggests that this chains well with other arc movement, Joe suggests that clever build crafting may harness this as just another jump to become truly, quote, degenerates with jumps. Bones of AO, anybody? Now weapons. Weapons shown off include wild new ideas and some returning favorites. The pre-order bonus for the final shape is Tessellation, which is a fusion rifle that adapts to player elements, allowing the use of strand or stasis in the energy slot for the first time. It also has an alt fire projectile mode, which cranks out a ton of damage. Now, two new weapons were also teased as being inspired by other aspects of the game. One is a golden gun sniper rifle. They literally were like, yo, what if we just made a 
weapon that shot golden gunshots. They also have a Traveler Death Star Beam Trace Rifle, which looks amazing. Now, they featured two new weapon subfamilies. One is a Rocket Pistol Sidearm, and they mentioned it's slow-firing, hard-hitting weapons with slight AoE damage on impact. There's also going to be a Support Auto Rifle, which is also going to be slow-firing, but it can switch between dealing damage to enemies or to healing allies. Now, this is unique because support weapons have really just been in the exotic category. Think things like Lumina and the Navigator. This is going to bring new functionality, but to legendary weapons. Now, when discussing Well Radiance, Joe mentions this as another angle by which that problem is being attacked. Now, in addition, there are also going to be four returning exotics from Destiny 1. One is Red Death. This is the pulse rifle from Destiny 1 that essentially inspired Crimson, but it will be returning as a solar weapon, unlocking on day one of the season pass for episode one. Not sure what episode one is. Don't worry. Hang tight. We're going to talk about it in just a moment. Now, other weapons that are returning include Kvostov. Yeah, no longer is it just going to be dedicated to a cinematic. It's finally coming back and hopefully it's going to be better than the D1 version because honestly, guys, it really wasn't that good. Dragon's Breath is another one that really wasn't that spicy. It got some updates in year three of Destiny 1, but let's be real. We only use Dragon's Breath to cheese the Undying Mind. But Bungie did mention that both of those exotics are coming back with some new twists. And finally, Necrochasm was spotted during the Crotus Inn raid trailer, which is very likely it will be the raid exotic for Crotus Inn. We don't really know how it's going to function or if it's essentially going to be the exact same. If it's going to be like it was before, though, I do think there's probably going to be a quest associated with it, but we'll see. Now, one last note on weapons. When asked about their favorite components of the final shape, Joe emphasized that he's hyped about the new weapons coming most of all. And he stated that the weapons team is really pushing to make weapons that are so exciting to use that you instantly adopt them and shake up your play style, which is exactly how it should be. Now, moving on to systems. Gameplay systems got a lot of attention in Lightfall, and it seems like the final shape is pushing things even further here. The long rumored rework of the power system in Destiny 2 has two components to it. Number one, fixed powered activities such as seasonal activities, campaign missions, and normal difficulty exotic quests will set players to a fixed power level like we've seen in recent seasons. Now, these activities may have multiple difficulty settings, and it will provide an intentionally designed difficulty balance. And Bungie mentioned that this is meant to be intuitive for players unfamiliar with the power system, and that the final shape campaign is confirmed to be a fixed power set of missions. Now, they mentioned that fire team power applies in non-fixed power activities, raising the effective power of all players to then match the highest power player in the squad. Now, fire team power is intended to allow new and returning players that haven't kept up with the grind to play all manner of content with their friends. As of right now, fire team power raises under level players to five levels below the highest level player on the team. Now, this applies to non-fixed power activities such as raids, dungeons, and grandmasters that require a certain level to be effective. Current exception to this is Trials of Osiris. Bungie prioritizes fairness over accessibility when it comes to trials. Now, fire team power will be tested at some point during episode one, but that will be clearly communicated beforehand. All that being said, guys, the power system itself isn't going away. The devs insist that grinding for in-game pursuits will fundamentally be the same, and footage shown in the trial displays power levels all the way up to 2010. Now, Fire Team Finder is the name of Destiny 2's in-game LFG that will launch the start of Season 23. And guys, this is three months before the final shape. Now, this run-up period will ensure Bungie has time to deploy, test, and then update the Fire Team Finder so that it's stable going into the final shape. Now, the categories shown off in the showcase were raids, dungeons, seasonal, vanguard, crucible, gamut, campaign, and other. Now, while the descriptions of its functionality were limited, several images of the interface reveal a detailed yet simple way to select what mode you want to play, what kind of team you're looking for, and several other preferences. The showcase emphasized the inclusion of tags as a way to customize your fire team finder posts and then filter results by language, playstyle, and more. Incoming KWTD? Now, while not shown, the post show revealed that the fire team finder will be accessible from the player roster when launching an activity, similar to the add fire team member that we see today. Now, Joe mentioned that while assembling a team, players that want to join can be manually approved or denied in case you like to look for a better fit to join your party. Overall, the interface resembles similar to that of looking for group systems as implemented on Xbox or other platforms, but has the benefit of being built into Destiny 2's client. And finally, the question everybody has been asking, what does this mean for guided games or guided games beta? Sorry to break your hearts, guys, but that system will be retired. I'm not gonna lie, guys. I don't even think I've ever used it once or at least successfully. It seemed like I can never find people to play with. Now, Bungie showcase timeline reflections, which are already live, but offer select story missions from past expansions to catch new and returning players up on major story beats throughout the franchise. Now, 
We really hope this becomes more fleshed out, offering missions from Destiny 1, the Red War campaign. I think contextually, you need to have that stuff in there. Now, let's talk about episodes. Episodes is what's going to be replacing the current seasonal model after the final shape. There will be three episodes after the final shape. Episode 1 will be Echoes. Episode 2 will be Revenants. Episode 3 will be Heresy. Now, interestingly enough, episodes will be four months long rather than just three. We talked about this here recently because we felt like the four seasons per year wasn't really working with Bungie and wasn't really working with us. I would prefer a more densely packed season. And in this case, it seems like episodes are going to be that. Now, each episode will have three acts, which will include major story beats that bring new content and updates with them. Now, the goal of the episode model is to innovate on the seasons. The devs acknowledging that they've reached their high of their usefulness. Seasons were limited, always skewing towards consistency and repetition because of how quickly they had to be assembled. Now, a new act drops every six weeks, providing nine big story updates per year, each with its own sandbox offerings. Now, season passes will continue to exist for episodes, but with a twist. Day one of an episode, a 100 rank pass will be available. Six weeks later, when act two of the episode releases, an additional 50 ranks will be added to the pass with both paid and free tracks, offering new rewards. Another six weeks later, with act three, a final 50 ranks will be added. Now, this means each season will offer a whopping 200 rank pass on both the paid and free tracks. Now, Joe also mentioned that like the Tiger Helmets in the 30th anniversary, Bungie is interested in offering free rewards at the end of these tracks that serve as iconic I was there win style armor rewards. Now, similarly, seasonal artifacts have some tweaks. Day one of an episode will include a full 5x5 artifact with all of its perks, just like today. But act two of that episode will add another row of perks on top of the artifact, raising its perk count from 25 to 30. Act three will do that again, meaning that for the final six weeks of each episode, players will have access to 35 seasonal artifact perks that of course will shake up the meta. Now, when asked about yearly expansions beyond these episodes, Joe strongly implied that we'll continue seeing regular expansions just like we do now. But the focus is on experimenting with episodes for now. Now, episodes will be available for 1,500 silver each, mentioning that the price increase over season reflects their larger size, but of course, less frequency. This also eliminates that shadow price hike when season costs went to 1,200 silver, but can only be purchased with bundles of 15. Now, finally, the Witch Queen will be available for all players on all platforms from August the 24th to August the 27th for completely free. And all expansions, including Lightfall, will be anywhere between 50% off and 67% off until September the 6th. So all around great deals here, guys. Well, there you have it. The final shape showcase for Destiny 2. No lie, guys. I'm going to talk about my thoughts more later this week. There were some things I was hoping to see. No lie, going inside of the Traveler has been something I wanted to do since Destiny 1. I'm glad it's finally happening. I really hope Bungie puts a bow on this finale. They spare no expense. This has been something we've been building up to for a decade. Again, my complete thoughts later this week. Fellas and ladies, thank you all for coming and watching. And as always, slap that like button like your mama told you right. Oh, 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 o